Hi, I have the pleasure and privilege of offering a vote of thanks to Dr Alison Sheridan for what I'm sure we will all agree was a majestic and very contemporary account of Scotland's Neolithic delivered over six hours. There's no doubt that Alison delivered on the title of this Rhine series. The big picture and the detailed narrative were covered in depth and with a breadth and level of detail that I honestly don't think that anyone else could have taken on. Now these are, we are told, unprecedented times, and these Rhine lectures have been no exception. It was, for instance, refreshing to be able to partake of a glass of wine during the lectures rather than afterwards. Now not only is Alison the seventh woman to have given lectures as part of this prestigious series, but also the first to do so online, and as well as, I presume, the first to mention Ant and Deck, and possibly to say Turd. There was an irreverence to the lectures that I really enjoyed, and none of it was, I'm glad to report, a load of old balls. Alison's cheeky sense of humour very much enlivened these lectures and broke the mood from time to time between lengthy, illustrated discussion of illnesses, injuries, violence and coprolites. It was right that Alison paid due credit to Alexander Rind, whose legacy these lectures are. But it's also fair to say that women have been horribly underrepresented through the lengthy history of the Rind Lectures, something the current director of the society is now addressing, of course. To my mind, the Neolithic of Scotland has also been neglected to date, although, of course, has cropped up from time to time in Rind Lectures with a broader Neolithic scope by the likes of Stuart Piggott, Gabriel Cooney and Richard Bradley. But I would argue that Alison's lectures have been the most detailed and focused Rinds on this period of Scottish prehistory since the lectures of Joseph Anderson in 1882, and even then Anderson spent half his time on the Bronze Age. I therefore welcome this chance for a leading scholar to give a detailed reflection on the current state of play in the study of the Scottish Neolithic, and there's literally no one better to deliver this than your speaker, Alison Sheridan. I've known Alison for a long time. My earliest memories of her were studying an assemblage of Neolithic pottery from Clash Timber Hall that was currently being held in Gordon Barclay's dining room for some reason 20 years ago. I hadn't then, and still have never, met someone who knows so much about Scotland Neolithic, and Alison knows a lot of stuff about other periods as well. This has been played out during these Rhine lectures, a panoply of techniques, new data, publications and old favourites washed over us during the six lectures, but we did not drown in this sea of data, Alison safely captaining us to the dry land of common sense and pragmatism if I may mix my metaphors horribly. I would also add that a refusal to go along with theoretical fashions, to be buffeted by the waves of those theoretical fashions, just for the sake of it, is, is also an important aspect of Alison's work, and it was evident during several enjoyable many rants in her lectures. This intellectual consistency is admirable and recognised in the business. What do others say, say about Alison, Archaeologist of the Year? awarded the Graham Clark Medal, Fellow of the British Academy, the Society of Antiquaries, and the August Society that sponsors this series of lectures. She is a veritable archaeological superstar who managed to wow Chris Packham when talking about the Orkney Vole on an island on a BBC show about Neolithic Orkney, and I believe she has also impressed Doogie Vipond at Callanish. Others have been less complimentary about Alison, as she alluded to during some of her earlier lectures. Julian Thomas, for instance, has called her a revisionist. However, I think in the end, Alison has been shown to be a radical and brave thinker, often in the face of opposition from largely male archaeologists telling her she was wrong, me amongst them. Her constant stance on issues related to the drivers of social change in prehistory is one of her most significant legacies. There's no doubt that the intellectual and interpretive wind is most definitely in Alison's sails now, with ancient DNA not so much proving a right but rather adding another brick of evidence into what now seems to be a wall with more sturdiness than the boundary around the ring of the Ness of Brodgar. I'm happy to have been wrong all along, and I may well have been wrong all along, if we can get closer to making sense of what did happen in those vital centuries around 4000 and then again 2500 BC. The six lectures covered a huge amount of ground, starting with a pre-Neolithic Scotland populated by hunter-gatherer foragers, which, who Alison gave agency, where other Neolithic accounts have tended to depict people in the Mesolithic as just waiting around for something better to come along. The end of the Neolithic was dealt with pragmatically and in a balanced way, and throughout Alison avoided grand claims that are fashionable now in relation to, for instance, Stonehenge. She used the words 
and concepts immigration and immigrant with care and consideration. During the lectures, Alison also referred to a whole host of new and revamped techniques and methods that we now have at our disposal, from an analysis of isotopes and coprolites, to Bayesian statistics, to ancient DNA. This was a masterclass in clear and concise explanation of some very complex techniques, and all six lectures will become required viewing, not just for my students, but I'm sure for all students of archaeology across the land. But what was also impressive was that Alison situated all this shiny new flashbang technology within the rich heritage of Neolithic scholars working with Scottish material over the decades, with warm mentions of the likes of Graham Ritchie, for instance. And this was typified by the moving dedication of the lecture series to the late John Coles. Alison finished her amazingly detailed overview with five research questions, and I was delighted to see that number five related to Atlantic rock art, and was one that I can perhaps help with in the coming years. This took me back to our time chairing the Scarf Neolithic panel a decade ago, and although we did not see eye, eye to eye all of the time during that process, we did come up with a document to be proud of. And I was also delighted to see Ludovic Mann pop up from time to time in Alison's lectures, another figure who has helped to shape, albeit in a modest and slightly weird way, our understanding of Neolithic Scotland. In the fifth lecture, Alison raised the wonderful image of people, of, sorry, of ideas being parachuted into archaeology by men of a certain age, essentially mansplaining to Alison about carved stone balls. And I can guess a whole load of other things as well. I can empathise with this, albeit men tend not to mansplain with quite as much enthusiasm and conviction to other men as they do to women. But it was great to see these carved stone balls get some dedicated time. Talking about these is of course a real crowd pleaser, but it was fantastic to see some old chestnuts debunked and also a sensible, balanced view of these presented in the public domain. This was a model of how to deal with eccentric pseudo-archaeological theories with sensitivity um, and common sense, but once again demonstrates that in the end, the archaeologists always have the best ideas. Alison's plea for the enigmatic to be removed from the way these objects are described, I think can more broadly and increasingly be applied also to the Neolithic of Scotland as a whole. She has very much made the point in her lectures that far from being mysterious, challenging, enigmatic and puzzling, the kinds of words commonly used in media stories about prehistory, our understanding of the Neolithic of the place we now call Scotland has never been better or more sophisticated. While unknowns remain, for the most part we know what those unknowns might be, and have a, be a bigger than ever toolkit to solve these tenaciously difficult issues. To conclude this already overly verbose vote of thanks, I would like to say that I believe that these Rhine lectures represent the most complete synthesis of Scotland's Neolithic ever produced. One need not agree with every idea to appreciate the breadth, depth, scope and comprehensiveness of Alison's lectures. These lectures free to view in perpetuity and any subsequent publication, and please do write this book Alison, will be the baseline from which all future research into the topic should begin. I suspect they will still be remembered next century in the way that Anderson's rhymes still cast a shadow over what we do today. Finally, I would like to thank Simon Gilmore for asking me to give this vote of thanks and so allow me to secretly see all these lectures before everyone else, but not allowed to tweet about it, much to my frustration. I also want to thank the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland for maintaining this great tradition and evolving in the rather tricky circumstances of the last few months, and also to the sponsors of the event, AOC. But most of all, I would like to thank Alison for these wonderful lectures and for generously sharing her enormous expertise with us. Thank you, Alison, and cheers. Oh, wow.